our next panel is uh, already on stage, which is, is great of them. Um, this is our big deal panel, and you know, we could do one of these a month these days, but this one, this one's special because it brings together a lot of these topics that we've discussed already. Company culture, scaling, partnering with bigger companies, and we're gonna hear how these all added up into one signature deal. Last October, Kellogg entered the, the entrepreneurial brand game by buying one of the country's fastest growing nutrition bar companies, RX Bar, for about 600 million. Um, that's a significant number and it also anticipates a lot of growth for the brand to justify the cost of the deal. So how does this happen? Who makes the introduction? What brings these companies to the table? What's there to gain on all sides? How does it get hammered out? We're fortunate to be able to bring the principles of the deal together, along with the investment banker who made it happen, to explore the path to this deal. So we have uh, Jared Rosenbaum, the Senior Director of Corporate Development and Strategy for Kellogg. Janica Lane, the, uh, a Managing Director at Piper Jaffray, covering consumer. And Peter Rahal, uh, the CEO and co-founder of RX Bar. So welcome, guys. <laughs> So, I want to start off by trying to understand where each of your specific organizations were at the start of the process. Peter, why were you looking to sell? So, Jared and I, um, he's the co-founder, um, it's around February last year, I think we, we started getting like a couple inbound inquiries, we were becoming on the radar. Um, and so the question was for us, like, what do we want to do with the business? Um, and then something for, something Jared and I have always done really well doing is like separating ourselves as shareholders, as owners, and like, and then as employees. And so we, we asked, our, asked ourselves the question, as owners, what do we want to do? Um, and there's clear like a fork in the road of like, all right, do we keep this thing private and, and, and a family business or do we like, join something greater and become public or jo join a great organization and take this thing to the next level. Um, and so we, so we chose that path. Um, in anticipation, there's just like fear that like these big CPG companies are these evil monsters. And so that was my percep perception prior to the process. Um, kind of like skeptical and critical of it. Um, but so it wasn't like, all right, we're gonna go sell it. It was more like, let's go see what this looks like just go on a couple dates, and then figure out from there. Who were you dating? Kellogg. <laughs> <laughs> um, was Kellogg one of the early inquiries? Was it, and, and if so, why? So I would say we, we generally wouldn't comment about when and where we express interest. Um, but certainly, I, I would make the comment that, uh, you know, we are always... Uh, internally, right, looking at our portfolio, looking at where we want to be positioned, and looking at the marketplace in terms of what's emerging and what's coming. And what obviously, one of the things that is uh, different about RX Bar is that if you had said 18 months ago, hey, who do you think the emerging, you know, bar company is going to be? Um, you know, there, there, there's a good handful of them that are all in the same size range, and you, you wouldn't have necessarily said, this is the one that's just going to explode, um, but, you know, then shortly thereafter, the growth really accelerated. And so, um, in, in some ways, they were, um, they were more unexpected than maybe a traditional process where, where, where a company sort of has a, a, a more um, normal trajectory of growth and you have more time to watch it and think about how it fits into your portfolio. So, one quick question. Was that sort of explosive growth, did that make it more attractive as an investment or less attractive because it was gonna cost more? 
Well, it's always, uh, it's always a question of why is the company growing, right? It's not the absolute dollars, it's not the percentages, it's what is driving the company's growth, why is it happening? Uh, you know, um, I'll make a casual comment that is, amazingly, most companies that are positioning themselves for sales seem to have really good growth right before that. <laughs> And so you, you always want to be on alert, right? Is there something going on or is this fundamental? And anybody who knows the RX bar story understands what a great product it is and the appeal that it has. And anybody who eats it is very passionate about it. And so it doesn't take long to study a company like this and understand that this is legitimate growth, which makes it exciting. Yeah. You also sometimes see, boy, their expenses just dropped in payroll <laughs> pre-deal. Well, and I'll let Peter talk to this more, but RX Bar, one of the things that made RX Bar special is, you know, it was a fast growing company, a lot of great dynamics, but the culture and the, the infrastructure that Peter was building was really, really special. And it wasn't, it wasn't just numbers on a page, it wasn't, uh, you know, just how many people and what do we have to do with them. It was this great group of people that were all driving towards a common purpose that, that, that frankly is is very special and unique. So, Janica, at what point do you come on board? Sure. So, my story of getting to know RX Bar is I'd actually met the product, at least in the brand, when they were in their old packaging, which Peter and his co-founder Jared made in PowerPoint, and it was like the worst packaging that I'd ever seen. Um, the, for the product was totally amazing, and then the packaging switched, and you started just hearing all of this chatter through the CrossFit community and various people that were kind of in the know on the nutrition side. And usually with this community here, we all just get introduced to all these companies, and somehow I'd never been introduced to RX Bar. So I think it was a couple of years ago now at that little sweets and snack show in Chicago, I actually stalked RX Bar. It's the only company I've ever done that to and met uh, there at the time, head of sales, Sam, at a trade show and just started to to develop their relationship. And it just on that point of growth, when we actually went down the path of pursuing the transaction, I think one of my biggest concerns was when you have a company that's literally going to triple in sales or something in, in the year of the transaction, how do you actually demonstrate sustainable growth, to Jared's point? And I think everything around culture and management and all the interactions, the more you got to know about the, this company, the more you knew it was sustainable growth. Every member of management knew why they were there, gave a ton of confidence. Every interaction with the team, they knew exactly where they were going, and you could definitely see how this business could continue to scale. Peter, uh, what accounted for that, that burst of growth, and, and were you preening with that? Were we what? Were you guys preening with it's that? preening. You know, sort of showing, <laughs> hey, we can do this. Oh, no. We call it perfuming the pig. <laughs> no, first context, like we have a really special group of people. Um, great, uh, awesome company. Like, I can't take credit for anything. Um, we, oh, just from the, the reason why we never like known Janico or anything like that is because we thought it was a distraction. To, to talk to investment bankers because we weren't in the market. So we were just laser focused. I think that focus is part of the reason why we had results. Um, but no, we, we, we've always just wanted to build the best business possible. Like we want to do sales the best way possible, supply chain, every function we try to do the, be the best at. Um, and the collective group it, it re results in great product, great execution, great R&D, all, all all of it all works together. Um, but no, we've never like primed, you know, we never primed the business for a sale. Um, the timing was like perfect from like an accounts perspective coming on. Like the summer, like our forecast was I think 100 million, which was like our stretch. So like the realistic one was like maybe 85. And I think I like to talk gross when it's convenient. Um, <laughs> Our gross was was 161 that year. That's amazing. So it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. So you're here, and then you're actually here. And that's demand. It's not like us, f you know, pushing too hard. Mm -hmm. It's just satiating demand. Um, so. so what? Uh, first of all, why were you looking at bars? And then, uh, is that how do you say? Well, this is going to cost more. We got to. We still got to get in. Well. 
<clears throat> so from a strategic perspective, as I mentioned, we're always looking at our portfolio. We're always looking at what's happening. What do consumers want? And w without going into all the nuts and bolts of our portfolio, it was very clear that we had a gap in terms of what people wanted and what was uh, really on trend. And so it's very obvious, right, that, that everything about our X bar is what people want. It's real ingredients, um, you know, natural things like that. Uh, and so let's just assume that we, we believe in that. Um, the, the growth doesn't, and, and this is very unique growth, right? I mean, you had to believe that it had more trajectory and this wasn't some kind of fluke anomaly for a year. But at the end of the day, um, we don't make an acquisition to see a company go from 50 to 60 million or 100 to 120, right? We believe that, that the brand, the product, the potential of it is significantly greater, right? And it varies by every deal. But the fact that it was growing quicker in the near term uh, is not a deterrent. It, it just, it, it, can, it can confirm or deny what you believe. And in this case, it confirmed what we believed about the potential. So you're, were you able to look at it and say, well, this kind of growth is sustainable in our system if we do this, this, and this? Well, there's no, um, Tr uh, there's no tripling of growth that's sustainable because uh, they'd be a $30 billion company in a couple of years. But uh, it, it's, it's all the metrics that people look at, right? If you, if you can dig into the data and you can look at velocities, you can look at, at ACV, you can look at repeat buying, you can, you, can, you can get a feel for what those things look like. But it's also the potential of what is the market size, where's the market going, and, and it's, it's not perfect, right? There's no magic answer that you just say, this is exactly where this company's gonna be. But it also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it right back to the people, which is look at this organization, look at what they're capable of, and you can imagine the possibilities that can unfold. Um, were you saying, hey, it's Kellogg, it's Kellogg, or were you like, hey, go out on more dates, Janica? You know, all, I hate the word process. My whole team knows that. We need to coin a new word because there is no such thing as like a cookie cutter process. And I'd say this one was special, like, like they're all special, and it was special in particular ways. So yes, there were additional parties that came to the table, and you know, there were a whole range of factors that, that really mattered and other parties that, that we dialogued with as well. But at the end, it was very clear, I think, to the team that, that Kellogg was the right one. And uh, it's not just about value. It was certainly the cultural alignment piece. And uh, when Peter would talk about why a transaction to his team, he'd always say, this isn't a mass exodus. He'd tell buyers, this is the next step in the evolution of this business. And everybody was so on board with that, including Kellogg. So a lot of it at the end was very much this isn't about the value, it's about the relationship and what we can do together in the long term. So it eventually became clear, but I don't think that it could have been without um, getting to know other parties. Peter, at what point, though, were you saying, well, we, we really do need to sell? Or not need to, but we want to? Uh, Expo West 2017. Why? The that fear of like, oh, these big CBGs or these evil, like they're gonna fire me, or gonna fire Jared, fire Sam or whatever, wasn't true. Um, so once we validated that like, wait, like we could work, this could all work out, we can achieve our goals and like takes the biz take the business to the next level and brand, it was like, let's do this. So one of the things that, that as Janica was talking is, I, I, I would encourage anybody who's thinking about selling their business to go on multiple dates and talk to as many strategic companies as you can, because ultimately, when you think about selling your company, um, of course, to state the obvious, you're, you're, you're trying to get money, but you're also thinking about who you're giving your baby to, what is the evolution of this company, and it's important to talk to as many as you can to understand their perspectives, their culture, their people, what is their vision, and so I will tell you, we knew they were talking to other people, right, but our job as Kellogg is just to say, look, this is who we are, this is who our people are, this is what we think, and you may like us and you may not. And, and that, that would have been okay if, if, if Peter had said, look, we don't share your vision or we don't think that your people are the right people to help us get there. Obviously, we felt that we were, but if he had said that, we said, okay, we understand. But it's important to do that diligence as the seller to make sure that you're making the right decision. And like, we wouldn't have done a deal if there wasn't that alignment. Like, we didn't have to sell the company. 
What was the key to that vision? Op so, like, operating, like, like I said, uh, we didn't want to exit. Like, we didn't want to, like, there wasn't a mass exodus. We're not, like, um, everyone loves their job at a company. Um, and really, the, the, so operating, ways of operating, like, we didn't want to integrate. Uh, we wanted to stand alone. Um, and then, like, obviously muscle, that, that made sense f for us. So what capabilities were you looking for? Was it manufacturing, data? Yeah, manufacturing, so supply chain, obviously. I think anybody who's in an emerging food company knows supply chain's like your biggest headache, probably. Um, and then international expansion and just general muscle. Like when there, you have the scale of a $14 billion publicly traded company with all that expertise, like there's situations that, that that really comes in handy from an, from influencing an outcome. Now, uh, go ahead. Look, Jared and you know John Haugen and Will Lisman from Hershey. I mean, you guys are charming M and A kind of bastards, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, people want to work with you, I think, and. Then the question is, because we've seen this before, I mean, even, you know, on deals, not that you, you know, not on, not as a factor of deals that you've done, but sometimes we see these things fall apart on a cultural level. So how do you tie it in, knowing that culture is so important? So this is where my job is is A, a balance, but it's also not rocket science. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank people like me for my personality, and that obviously helps me make introductions and get to know people. It's, it's the wallet, actually. Yeah. <laughs> a big wallet helps. <laughs> no, but, just... but I tell people, anybody that I meet in here, I will always tell you, you know, of course, we can get to know each other, and I can help give you an introduction to Kellogg, but ultimately, you need to get to know Kellogg, which means you, get, you need to know our leadership, you need to know the specific leadership that you would interact with. So if you know, you're know you a, a frozen company, you want to meet our frozen team. If you're a snack food, you want to meet our snack team. And so I can tell you throughout the RX bar process, I mean, I had Peter meeting everybody I could think of. He met our chief growth officer. He met our head of North America. He met our snacks team. He met other people. Because ultimately, whether you like me or not really doesn't matter. It's the people that you're going to be working with when this is over. And of course, I want them to like each other, but it goes back to that cultural fit. If you have two people that just don't see eye to eye or don't share the same vision, then it's not going to work. And there's mm -hmm. no reason from either of our perspectives to fake that because you're, they're going to lose and we're going to lose, right? We're spending a lot of money to do an acquisition. And if it's all built on a, a fallacy, then that's not going to work. So ultimately, it's about getting exposure deeper in the company and building that trust and relationship. Were there areas that needed to be worked out? You know, there weren't really, and it's so interesting from the investment banking perspective, I feel like historically it's almost been a strategy in banking where you try to give as little interaction as possible between buyer and seller, which makes absolutely no sense, right? Because the thesis is our client is going to do or say something crazy that's going to scare <laughs> somebody, right? And these guys are just like big corporate dinosaurs and they're going to scare our client as well. And part of the, the whole thinking here was, listen, these are all grown-ups. If they screw it up, they screw it up. It probably wasn't meant to be. But let's develop the relationship as much as possible. So one of the unique things that actually came out of this process was so much interaction. It was... Kellogg in the office to, to just feel the buzz at the RX bar office. It was a lot more face-to-face. -face. It was Peter and the other Jared going to Battle Creek and really getting to know the team there and a whole lot of dialogue that, that the banker folk were and weren't involved in that I think was super important for that, that cultural alignment and thinking about what was next after the actual deal was closed. That must have required opening up communications to both teams earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you manage that? Yeah, so the cool thing about working at RX Bar and like a bit of give you guys insight to like our culture. Um, so like we have we no BS you see it on our packaging and that like that really is nonsense and, and and it translates it trends like it's a reflection of our culture. So we just anything anytime where there's bullshit, we just want to remove it. Um, and so 
when you think about that, and then as it relates to the process or like selling the company, like it is bullshit not to tell the people that are working so hard for, for the company that what's going on. Yeah. And it's also bullshit not to be proud of it either. Um, what is there to hide? And so we do these monthly team meetings and town halls and, and funny story, like, so this was very like controversial that we were doing this. So it was around May, it was May or May monthly team meeting. So basically March and March was Expo West, April was like discussion and then we're like, all right, we're doing this. And so we were like, we got to tell the whole company. Um, and so in a very RX bar way, the opening slide of the, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the lawyer? <laughs> lawyer? <laughs> no, thankfully. Sam. Um, so anyway, opening slide, for team town hall, and everyone's like, excited, and there's like 50 people, and I'm always like nervous as shit for these. And the opening slide goes, we've decided to find a strategic partner. A strategic partner means we are selling the business. <laughs> And like, I remember like, I like bold ideas. So we're like, yeah, we're really excited. We're just gonna lay it out there. We're not gonna massage it. We're gonna just, you know, where there's nothing to hide. It's great. And we said, we go up there and I say it and like everyone's look, you know, I would totally underestimated what people's reactions were and everyone's like. Oh. <laughs> and so I was like, fuck, shit. Uh, <laughs> but, but eventually like we gave the rationale of like, here's why we're doing it. This is why it makes sense. And you know, we're not gonna look for a partner that's gonna fire everyone. Like that's not what, no one wants to do that. Like, um, and it was amazing because those days on, you know, if there was no secret meetings or secret phone calls, like I'd have like calls with Jared. I'd just be, on, I'd be walking around the office just talking about it. And it was so liberating. There's no secrets. Um, like every single time, like, hey, we need to meet with m and team, like bring them to our office. Like it was such a powerful thing and it was a reflection of like our intention too. You know what I mean? We weren't lying. There's no lies throughout the entire thing. Um, so, but for our culture, it was, you know, we walk the talk, you know, right? We talk about culture, like actions are everything and it was an action that shows like, hey, we're in this. And so, but it was really controversial. Like we were worrying about, you know, everyone leaking, leaking the deal news, but like our team didn't, Investment bankers leak the deals, not your people. Not you, but the, <laughs> the ones that don't make the bake off, or what do they call it? It's so true. Did you guys, but there was a leak, right? There had to have been. Now, raise your hand if you knew the deal before the deal. <laughs> well, the Wall Street Journal did, right? Yeah, I that's mean, what I'm saying. So, so why would you not tell your people? Yeah. The other thing I would say is it really helped us, and I, I can't point to the specifics, but I can tell you when you're going through a process, right, you're asking for information, you, you, you need things from the company to help your analysis, and when only one person or three people know about it, you can't possibly get all the information that a company of 50 or 70 people have. And so the fact that everybody knew about it just facilitated the, the process better. Uh, you're, you don't have a CEO who's guessing. You, he can go to somebody and say, hey, can you answer this question? And everybody was on board. And as Peter said, it really goes back to the culture. Yeah, and great stat that I'm, we're very proud of is it's been eight, nine months, whatever. We haven't lost one person. And let me t they, have been, they have been recruited heavily, <laughs> and we have not lost one. So That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Jenica, I got to ask, though, like, this, this sort of team alignment toward the sale, I mean, how come this hasn't happened before? It does happen. It does happen on other deals. I think here it was just much more deliberate in some respects how it happened, but, but it certainly happens all the time. I think it was just really unique. One of my observations was that when you have teams like this that all trust each other, you kind of have to just establish that up front. Like, we're all working towards the same goal. There's 100% trust. You make decisions fast and you make the right ones. And that's what started happening with this whole group. And it wasn't so much that there were sides. You know, I think when we knew that Kellogg was the right one or these guys knew, there weren't sides anymore. Everyone was just working to get a deal done and thinking about what's next. And it, I mean, it wasn't perfect. We encountered problems along the way. And I kind of feel like we could have like a whole funny outtakes video of 
Peter dropping F-bombs in introductory meetings, like us having a terrible meeting with a potential buyer. They didn't bring any of the right people to the table, even though they promised. And so we had a really fun road trip in the middle of nowhere. We toured yeah. some convenience stores. Yeah. Um, having challenges with, with a third party that we had to be very transparent with Kellogg about. I mean, there were, there were still challenges. It was just that there was 100% transparency, total truth on everything. and a real uh, desire to get the deal done. So there's that transparent context and that allows the snags. And let's face it, when we bring a panel up like this, we're not gonna get every snag in the deal out on the table. But I think what we're speaking to are methods to build transparency into a deal. Meet everyone, keep the team involved. Um, encourage comparison and share vision and hammer out a good price. So any, any last points on what's gonna make this thing ultimately a success? I mean, from my perspective, I would say it's, it's Peter and his team, and by his team, I mean everybody at RX Bar, right? This is, you know, Kellogg is a spectator. You know, we're going to help where we can. We're going we're gonna to do what we can. But ultimately, this is about what he's built and what they're continuing to build. And um, we're just really excited to be able to be a part of it. What makes it a success for you, Peter? So what makes it a success? I, for sure, our people um, and, a, and a common, like, ambition and vision. Like, we want to remove the bullshit from food. Um, and it's fun, like work's fun, and keeping it that way. Nice, and Janica, what makes it a success for you? You know, I think it's just seeing two organizations come together and nine months after the deal is done, they're still, still loving each other. I just took a photo of these two <laughs> hugging each other downstairs, <laughs> which is not, not always the case that you'd still have management around after a deal and you'd still have a buyer super happy. So I don't think that, that the RX bar way is the right way for all of you to, to think about doing deals going forward, but we certainly kind of figured out an X factor here. It's a model, That's if not right. the not model. That's right, not the model. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.